too often with book clubs and with people of that look like me uh it's like a if they if they pick up a diverse rom-com and they can check off the box right i've read a diverse monk a rom-com with a muslim protagonist check and it's done and i especially because i read your books almost back to back i wanted to have a conversation about that whole idea of the the, the danger of a single story of a, and you know so often we have this one idea of what a Muslim protagonist might look like and sound like, and I don't want that. And I don't want, uh, I don't want somebody to go into a bookstore and just pick up one of your books. I want somebody to go into a bookstore and pick up both of your books and probably another two besides, so that they get that that sense of there is no one voice. It is not one monolithic entity. And I think both of your books have so many similarities that I just really enjoyed, but they were also such a beautiful contrast to each other. And, uh, I, and, I, and I, I think they should be bought together with, with a sourdough starter and possibly a coupon for biryani for chicken poutine <laughs> as like a, a whole package. <laughs> but anyway, that's just, you know, in my dream little world. Um, so I guess what I'd first like to talk to you about is uh, why is it, what is it about romance that speaks to you and makes you want to explore with your protagonists? Who wants to start? Why don't you get going? Why don't you start? Sure. Um, I love romance. I'm a romance reader. So it was kind of a no brainer for me when I started writing to start writing romance. Um, I love that, that I get this question, like, why write romance? I was like, well, that's just that. Why not? Like it's, it's never been another, there's never been another genre that I've wanted to write as much as romance. Um, the, the, the fact of it is that romance, I mean, I, I teach a class on, on rom-com writing and I, I myself have a background in psychology. And one of the things I talk about in the class is the brain science behind rom-coms about the serotonin and like the, the, parts of the brain that get fired up when we laugh and then the parts of the brain that get fired up when we feel romantic love. And there's that calming sensation that, that, that feel good feeling of rom-coms that we, we love it in movies. We love it in books. Um, and I wanted to recapture that. And I didn't go in saying, I want to do that for my diverse uh, background or my particular, um, my particular, I, I, I didn't go into this saying I'm going to do this great thing and, and give rom-coms to people of color. I just wanted to write rom-coms. And then for me, it made sense for me to write people from my own background. Um, but the rom-com was, the, was, was my first, was my first uh, reason for doing it there. I wanted to do rom-coms. Yeah, I, I think I had a similar approach. Um, it, it was also a why not. And it was also, I think at the time I was just thinking, it wasn't a deliberate choice. It was just, I, these are the stories that I started writing, the stories I kind of grew up reading. Um, I'm a big fan of romance too, and sort of those classic 90s rom-com movies. Uh, I've watched every single one multiple times and you know the classic 90s and early 2000s romantic comedy books. Uh, and so, and, and I'm sure like you, Farah, I just noticed they were always about white women. Uh, they were always about very specific Western or even maybe European centered uh, ideas. And I just wanted to see if I could expand that. And in the beginning, you always write for yourself, right? Like you write the book that you want to see in the world. And these are the books that I wanted to see in the world. And I'm so glad uh, that other writers are, I can see other writers are coming up behind us. So yeah, there was, it, yeah. it wasn't a, it wasn't premeditated. It was a, let's do this. Let's see what happens. And, and I love it because obviously these, your protagonists aren't from my community, but the beauty of uh, a well-written rom-com and a great character is that we see our, our, the, our greater humanity in the whole process. Right. Um, so one of the things that uh, the Canadian culture at large uh, likes is that uh, stereotype is that Muslim women, Muslim women are passive subservient and controlled by men. That's one of those lovely stereotypes. Right. Um, and I've never actually met a real Muslim woman for whom any of that is true, by the way. And I love that about your protagonists. They are both, actually, I'm going to say all four of them <laughs> are uh, fiery, they're passionate, they are ambitious, they are, they're great characters. And so I was wondering if you would like to introduce, uh, hopefully the people who are watching this, to your current character, so Hannah and then Rima. 
Sure. So Hannah Khan is a 24 year old visibly Muslim woman, uh, the daughter of South Asian immigrants. She lives in the east end of Toronto in Scarborough, which is also where I grew up. Uh, her mother runs uh, single handedly a uh, single handedly meaning she founded it. It's a uh, Indian restaurant, sort of like it was one of those mom and pop places that have amazing food, but not amazing decor. Uh, and she works there part time as a waitress. She has aspirations and dreams to work in public broadcasting. So she, to that end, she's interning at a, at a radio station in Toronto called Radio Toronto. Uh, and on the side, she has a podcast where she just talks about what it's like to be a young Muslim woman growing up, uh, you know, what her, her, her take on her world. Uh, and it's sort of like a diary that she makes anonymously. And one of her most faithful listeners is uh, Stanley P, who of course plays uh, a, a huge role because my novel is basically, you've got mail set in rival halal restaurants. Uh, but Hannah, like you said, is feisty and uh, very opinionated. Uh, and she has a really strong sense of loyalty to her family and also her community. And Farah, do you wanna introduce us to Rima? Yeah, so um, my character, Rina, is, she is um, older than, than uh, Uzma. She's uh, 20, not, no, 31. She's a 31, see, I, I've got too many projects on the go right now. Um, so she's a 31-year-old. She works in finance, kind of like uh, low-level finance for a retail company. She doesn't love her job. She hangs out with her friends a lot. She's in kind of a rut. And, and I think this is something that I did definitely intentionally, um, this idea of like the model minority that all uh, South Asian women are, are doing wonderfully and very ambitious. And Rena is not. She's in kind of a rut in her life. She doesn't love her job. Um, she feels like she, all of her friends are doing better than her. They're ahead of her. Um, but she's she's got her hobbies. Um, she like like uh, Fiona said, she loves sourdough more than anything. She loves bread. She bakes bread. She used to be a, a blogger, but family things happened. Um, so she's just kind of like coasting, um, but she's not happy. Um, and her biggest um, challenge in life is her family is very domineering and they're very uh, in her face and they keep setting her up with what they call the good Muslim bachelor. So one after the other, after the other. Um, so they found her another potential husband and they, they own the apartment she's living in. So they move him right across the hall from her and he's going to be working for her father. So she is all over this guy. He's hot. He's got a British accent. He loves her bread even more than she likes to make it. Um, but then when she finds out that he is another one of her parents set up and that she um, that he works with her her dad, then she's like, no, absolutely not. But then they become friends anyway, because they live across the hall from each other, and they're both really into food. And then together they enter a cooking contest where they have to pretend to be engaged because the cooking contest is for couples. So she's pretending to be engaged to the guy her parents want her to marry, but she has no intention of marrying him. And then hijinks ensue, and everybody <laughs> ends happy in the end. So is, is it fair to say that they're both on a quest to be their authentic self within their culture and the broader Canadian society? Would you say that that's a good overall statement? Yeah, I think so. As far as to yeah, the process. Yeah, I, I don't know if necessarily Rena's trying to be her authentic self within her. She does. She, she, she rejects her culture in that she feels that because her fa family is so overbearing, she ties that so much to her culture that she does kind of reject it. Um, so it takes her to till the end of the book to realize that um, the family dynamic of her culture is very much intertwined with who she is and you can't have one without the other and yeah. she becomes more accepting of of her parents involvement in her life yes so then let's tell us about the male love interests and how um, did you create them and how did you make them a good partner for your for the wonderful women that you have already created yeah, I always think about, uh, you know, with rom-coms, you want to, like, like, the main couple are so important, right? and you want to give them sort of uh, flaws and personality that really complement each other, even though if they, e even when they don't really understand that and realize it. So Aiden, and all this, this happens with all of my characters, I spend a lot of time thinking about the people that I want to write about, they kind of walk with me and, and live in my head for months, sometimes years before I even start writing them which is why it takes me so long to write my books. And so Aiden, um, I think I started with his name. I wanted a name that wasn't 
obviously Muslim. Like Aiden could be a name that could be any type of ethnicity. It, it is pronounced like like a A I D A N type of name. Um, and and I I just thought about this person who had because I, I I know people like this. They uh, and, and uh, Farah, I guess you know you have a character who also has this has this issue has a very domineering parental figure uh and how does he deal with that like how where is the bridge to becoming your own man so his father is extremely critical has very high expectations expects Aiden to almost like live his life in the pocket of his father and he uses uh the father uses money and influence and power in order to control his child and like one of the stereotypes you alluded to earlier Fiona was about the the um, Muslim women have a stereotype of being so subversive, uh, submissive, sorry. And I was subverting that by making the son kind of in the beginning of the book, very cowed by his father uh, and to, to kind of have that conversation. Because to be honest, I've seen more of that than I have of women being cowed and submit, uh, submissive towards their their family. The women tend to be rebels and the, the boys tend to bow and do whatever the parents say, uh, which is a really interesting dynamic. So I started off with that. And so as much as my book is, uh, it's a first person narrative told by Hannah Hahn, uh, it's also a uh, coming of uh, coming of age story uh, in his late 20s for Aiden. So he really changes and he, uh, by the end of the book, no spoilers, but he he does undergo a dramatic shift. Uh, and as for why he's grumpy and grouchy and kind of conniving in the very beginning, it's because I love those heroes. I love those like, uh, you know, I like you, but I don't want to like you type of romantic heroes. I'm grumpy because, you know, I don't know what to do with these feelings uh, type of guys. Those are my favorite types of heroes. One of the things that struck me when I read Uzma's book is that Aiden's family was very much like my Nadine's family. The, the family, they both came from very domineering parents that wanted to influence their sons. But then the two characters are so completely different. And going back to what you're saying, it's not a monolith. People can grow up in very similar ways and still react to that very differently. Nadim has overbearing father who wants to control his son, um, literally moved him across the world to marry somebody he didn't know. And true, Nadim went along with it, but he he, it, he didn't um, he didn't embrace the the lifestyle that his father wanted him to embrace. He didn't um, for his whole life. He's just kind of done his old his own thing while his father's in the background and being scolding him and criticizing him, and he's still just doing his own thing. Um, I wanted when I created him so. Um, Rena is a, a side character in the Chai Factor in my debut. So I, I had Rena. I knew her. I knew what she was like. And I also knew her problems with her issues with her parents and her sister. And I felt really terrible for her. I always loved this character so much. Um, and I felt so terrible for her. I'm like, Rena deserves like the perfect man. She doesn't deserve anything less than somebody who's absolutely perfect for her. So it's like, okay, she loves cooking. So let's create somebody who loves eating like more than anything. Let's give him the body of Captain America and a British accent because, um, because she's going to find that hot. Uh, her family is originally from Tanzania. So I made him a recent immigrant from Tanzania because I know that she would love it. So I just created the perfect man for Rena because she deserved no less after everything she's been through. But then of course I had to add, there has to be a glitch, right? There has to be something in there that um, that makes him not uh, ideal. And the one thing for Rena, the one thing that that she would would be her only deal breaker would be if um, his presence in her life is because of her family. That would be the only deal breaker she had. Even before she met him, she would, as soon as her parents would set her up with someone, she's like, no. So that was the deal breaker that I created for him. Um, so it was just for for me. I wasn't trying to subvert anything. I just wanted to create the character because I think Rena deserved perfection. Faith, family, and community are important parts of both Hannah and Rena's lives. Um, it's a bat in an underhanded way, especially for Rena, because you're like, uh, and sometimes they are both the source of conflict and struggle, and yet at other times, a huge source of strength and support. Um, I watch these families in the fiction, but I also watch these families in my friends and in my students. And I envy that because I have, I, and I'm an immigrant too, but it's just my mom, my dad, my brother and me, and there is no extended family. There's no real sense of, of community or, or a lot of good food, uh, sadly. Um, and, and so I watch this and I love it. But as you can, as you clearly, sh and I miss it. I, I feel like I'm missing out on something, even though I've never had it. And I, I guess, 
how authentically do you think you're describing this? And I don't, I don't even know where the question is. Faith, fam <laughs> faith family, and community. It's a really big deal. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I can, uh, I can talk about that. Um, I thought your question was very well, well, well put together. Um, so one of the things that people often ask me is like, will you always write about big families or, or this community? I'm like, well, if I'm, I, I don't think I know not how not to. Um, if immigrant communities are, whether whether you're alone in Canada without your actual relatives in Canada or in the US or wherever with you, or if you are um, have come alone, um, you will always find a community here, a like-minded community. Immigrant family communities uh, have to be close-knit because we uh, we rely on each other for that common culture, food, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just the way that my worldview is. So I can't imagine not writing a big cast of characters. Um, one of the things that I've noticed when I when I read books by South Asians is there's things that I pick up on as a South Asian that is very um, very cultural that other people might not. Like for example, in Accidentally Engaged, Rena's very good friends with her cousin. Um, and that is something that most people wouldn't really think twice about, but South Asians are like, that felt so real to me. That's how my, I am with my cousins. Um, also the fact that your cousin is your friend, but also family. So there's some things you can't tell them because you don't want that auntie to find out. And that kind of dynamic is very uh, common in South Asian families because we're all such big families and we're all very close. So there's little things like that, that I um, don't even realize that it, that it is cultural markers. Um, but it is very much South Asian dynamics when the way we interact with our parents, our sisters, our cousins, um, and our communities. The auntie thing, it's almost like a, it's a term of respect. Like I'm an auntie to all of my son's friends, especially if they're brown, they're like, I'm Uzma auntie. Uh, but we're obviously, we're not related. But in, uh, I, I don't know about you, Farah, but for me in the body culture, it's very specific. If, when you're related, that's a different word. So like mm -hmm. my yeah. khalas are specifically my mother's sisters and sometimes my mother's cousins, that's khala. And then my pupu is my dad's sister. And then my cha, -cha is my dad's younger brother. So it's really specific yeah. about the accounting, but auntie and uncle is just, it's like- Everybody saying, else is auntie, but I have like my mommy, my mama, my nanny, my, like everything is very specific to what the relation is, but everybody else is an auntie or an uncle. Yeah, exactly. So it's almost like the auntie and uncle are the honorifics, the Mr. and Mrs. Uh, and then the aunt, and then the specific title tells you, and he, he, you can even say, oh, this is my, my, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the word right now. My 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 brother's wife. You know that's a different title. Uh, something with a B. I, I, it's 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 gone for me. But yeah, for me, I feel like uh, it, with Hannah, she didn't have a lot of extended family per se in in Toronto, but she had her a lot of family overseas that her mother was so close to, but she wasn't particularly close to. So she had uh, then the surprise visitors, the mysterious guests that came in were basically extended family that she hadn't seen in decades or at all. And this was Gokub and Rashid and her 18 year old cousin. And then her much older uh, aunt, who was her mother's first cousin came to visit and stayed with them. Uh, and I was trying to capture that experience too, because sometimes when you have like for, I, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of family in, in Toronto, but I know some of my friends who are South Asian, whose parents are South Asian immigrants, they don't have a lot of family here um, at first. Maybe they'll immigrate later on, but they have a lot of family in, you know, various parts of the world, like maybe in the Middle East or they're in, you know, in India or, or wherever they are. Uh, and, but then they come and they visit and they'll visit for a long time. Like I used to have, you know, like my, my grandparents, for instance, would, would come and stay for months at a time. And, you know, uh, we'd grow up in like smaller homes. So someone's giving up their bedroom for an extended amount of time. Uh, and, and I wanted to, and then I, I've had the situation where I had an aunt and uncle basically give my parents zero, uh, you know, uh, advance warning and they just kind of showed up and they're like okay we're here and then you have to put them up you don't have a choice and my my husband's uh, dad uh used to welcome like even random strangers who just kind of knew his family back home but they were from the same part of india kerala they would just kind of he, he would just pick them up from the airport and they would just stay with him for weeks and until they got established he was like you know, low key uh, refugee resettlement in 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 the east end, west end of the city, and this is just something you do because you have that those ties that are so close back home. And I want that's what I was really kind of tapping into. And then the parallel story of the Golden Crescent in in Hannah Khan, which is a neighborhood where Hannah lives in. It's a fictional neighborhood, okay? It's not a real place. Um, I don't know. I mean, 
of course, to a certain extent, it's it's uh, uh, it's over exaggerated, right? Like it's not specifically. I don't think I don't know if there are actual neighborhoods where people are that close, um, but it's also kind of inspired by reality. So I grew up in a very tight knit mosque. It's the Islamic Foundation in Scarborough, um, and there's you know tons of tons of problems, tons of political you know maneuvering and things like that. But as a teenager growing up in that space, I also felt very comfortable, very welcomed. Like everyone who, uh, it felt like everyone who was there knew me, my, my parents, my siblings, my cousins. Um, and that sense of belonging uh, gave me a lot of confidence uh, as a young person that I think uh, kind of helped me identify uh, and stay, uh, stay true to who I was. So th that's what I was tapping into more than anything else. And it, to it totally comes through that sense that the, that the community, uh, is, especially with Han Hannah, that the, the community has her back, that she, yeah. and despite all, you know, the fact that she's, you know, sleeping every night on a lumpy, you know, she's not getting a good night's sleep and she's yeah. really not happy about it. And that her, her you know, her aunt uh, arguably dresses better than she does. Yeah. Uh, that, like the, that, that still that sense of the, she's, she's got a solid foundation. Uh, is is I think very much part of it, and I think Rena also has that, and she comes, but she comes to it later, maybe because she's older and she's I don't like there. There's definitely like Hannah, Hannah and Rena are at different parts in their lives as a as an yeah. early twenties and an early thirties. They they are they are you know they're, they're, there's a third of their lives basically that have been lived or not lived that it accounts for perhaps a lot of the different choices they make. In both stories, there are secrets, or not even secrets, but things that are simply left unsaid or undiscussed. And um, beyond it being a time-honored convention in fiction, which, you know, good dates back lots and lots, is it social commentary? Um, and specifically on things like gender roles and taboo subjects in immigrant communities. I feel like, uh, yeah, a lot of it is plot, right? A lot of it is just okay, something has to be saved for, to keep people going in terms of that. Um, but uh, the story, one of the stories is uh, Goga Pala. So she's the, the the aunt who comes visiting from India. She shares a story that sort of teased throughout the book and then she just kind of lays it all out. And Hannah uses this as, a, as one of her first uh, podcast episodes, her official podcast episodes that she, uh, you know, and, and she's really inspired by her aunt's actions. That's actually inspired by an actual real life uh, person in my family. So I had a I, I had a great aunt in India, and my my mother I never met her. My mother would always tell me the story about how she reacted when her parents were putting a lot of pressure on her to get an arranged marriage. She wasn't interested in getting married at all, and she took sort of extreme steps in order to get out of uh, the expectation to marry at a young age. And so Gokabhala was inspired by that real person. But this the having that as a secret is I think a really funny thing because even in my family, it was sort of like, nobody really wanted to, to talk about it, but also everybody already knew the story and they all thought it was hilarious, but it was not acceptable to laugh about this because she didn't behave the way a pro proper young woman did. And that's you know no example for the, the other young ladies who need to toe the line and get married when their parents tell them to, <laughs> but everyone still told the story. So it was one of those like kind of secret threads that my mom was like, oh my God, I have to tell you a story. And when she told me this, it was just a huge joke in my family, uh, but also a scandal. So I, I just I just think every family has this, like, right? Like, oh, that uncle who did that weird thing or that cousin who ran off and, you know, kind of scandalized the family and the community. Uh, and, and it's both something that you never want to talk about that is never really openly discussed, but kind of like, you know, behind closed doors, everyone is like, tell me the dirt. What happened? Why did they split up? What was the story? Um, everyone wants to know those, that juicy bit of gossip, right? Like every, uh, it's, it's, and I think that's what people read, even though they're not actually part of this community or part of the story. They're like, oh my God, what did she do next? Tell me what happens after that. Uh, but also I think the secrets are ways to bring up the themes of the book, right? So the theme themes of my book about community and uh, Hannah is, is obsessed with the idea of, uh, you know, she wants to start a podcast called Secret Family History. And what she wants to really explore is what are the ties that bind and what is the impact of our family uh, on ourselves? And what she's really trying to explore as a young, like you said, a young 20 something is her place in the world. Yeah, Farah, what about you? Definitely. Um... The secrets was a, a major theme of my book. Um, it's funny, my working title for it when I was writing it was Secrets and Sourdough. 
Um, every character in there has a secret that they, my, my editor did not like the title, Secrets and Sounds, <laughs> which is very smart. They never like her. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes when I'm writing something, if I have the title being a very obvious um, theme, then it reminds me to keep the theme going as I go mm -hmm. to make sure that it's on the front, front and center. Um, but definitely for, for me, my choice to do, to have everybody have these secrets, um, I was kind of exploring, especially, I don't know if this is common for every culture or whatever, but in my culture, there are these, um, there's a very, it's very important for people to put on a, a face that they, shows the world, which might not be um, the face that they uh, they show the family. Um, so they, everything is always proper, properly dressed. We throw these big parties. Um, and then all of the, the dirty laundry is just never talked about. And there are some families that I know that are very, that's exaggerated, where nobody really knows what goes on behind closed doors. And that was the kind of family I was trying to write. Um, and then here's my, my main character, Rena, who, who her, she herself is in this family. And she knows some of the problems that the family has had in the past. She knows about her sister's mental health struggles. She knows um, little bits. But even she doesn't know the true lives of what both her, her mother and her father have been going through for the last little while. Um, some of it was added, just some of the secrets were just there for comedic, for comedy. Um, but other ones are, are big things that the, the parents had dealt with, like the father had gone through this very devastating um, business. Uh, basically, he was betrayed by a business partner and she, she didn't know that. And the family never talked about it because they wanted to portray to the world that they were these very successful, very, um, very important business people. They didn't want to have the embarrassment of this large betrayal. Um, so the secrets were how Rena ended up getting to know her family and seeing them, seeing her parents as people instead of as these stern, stern beings that just tell her what to do all the time. Um, so I, I'm not going to give away, but she learned a secret about her mother, which I did put in there mostly for comedic relief. But as I, as I wrote it, I was like, but it actually makes perfect sense because her mother has always been shrewd and her mother has always been very strategic. And now she understands the background behind that. And then with her father, she was able to learn more about why he, um, why he put so much influence on her and, and why it was so important for, um, for the business to do well and why he brought Nadim from overseas to work. So she kind of got uh, understood more about her family's motivations by learning their secrets. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you both, in both cases, you use them for both comedy and to get to some really substantial um, social issues, uh, mental health uh, being another common thread in both. Of it. Well, they're both there, um, but let's face it, they're, they're everywhere. And that's, that's why they need to be part of every story, because they are part of every story, right? I, I think that that's, as we're moving forward as, as, a, as a society, we're, we, we, are seeing these and understanding and hopefully starting to talk about how how this is. Um, so in both books, food. <laughs> so um, I, I come from Scotland. They drink, um, and I got it. I mean, there's no. I don't know. Anyway, I feel like I've missed out. Um, it was anyway. So in both books, the action, the romantic chemistry, the conflict revolves around food and or food and or restaurants. Um, are you both personally foodies? Are you? Do you consider yourself foodies, and do you do a lot of cooking? I don't think I could have written that book if I wasn't a foodie. I went in writing a foodie book, and I think I just—I personally think I may have gone a bit overboard, but people have loved it. Um, there's a ton of food in the book, and uh, yeah, so I definitely I love cooking. I I I love baking bread. Um, every dish that Rena makes or her mother makes in the in the book are ones that I've made before. I didn't do any research. It was just from my head. Um, and I'm trying really hard not to write something so foodie right now and I'm failing and it's going to have a ton of food in it as well. Your, your Instagram posts about, you know, the bread that you've made always looks so mouthwatering. I want Thank to be you. like, I wish I lived closer so I could ask you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I come from, a, I never really considered myself a foodie. Uh, I just I just know that I love to eat and I and I have family who were excellent cooks and you know like like growing up my mom would throw these massive parties for people you know and our our small house in Scarborough she'd invite like a hundred people and then she'd spend two or three days beforehand just making massive pots of biryani and halim and 
and things like that. And it just seems so normal. It was like, this is a normal thing for us to do. And now that I'm an adult, I, I can't even imagine cooking for 20 people, leave, leave alone 100. And she would, she would literally make like trays of cheesecake just as part of her deal. So I, that, that's kind of like how I grew up and, and food because we, because, um, uh, in my family, we don't drink and no one that I know who is an observant Muslim drinks. Uh, and so food is the real highlight, right? Like the, the, the star of every party is food. So what the person made and what they have on, on tap or what, not literally on tap, but like what they have to present to their guests. And you go to that auntie's house because she makes like this particular dish really well, or that auntie does like an amazing roast. Uh, you know, you kind of look forward to that. So that, that's kind of the, the culture that I grew up in. And now we, we have, we put the, the kind of, uh, kind of the title of foodie around it. And I just never thought of it like that. It's just, we don't drink. So we eat. That's, <laughs> that's really what it is. <laughs> I think, I think all big South Asian families are foodies. They just don't call so them. Whether they drink or not, right? Yeah, that's like we food. know that that's yeah. the Dokra auntie. If you want Dokra, you have to go there. Or that's yeah. the what my, my grandmother's Nankatai or whatever. Everybody's. Yeah. And conversation. Like if you, if you go to any of these parties, there's going to be at least one conversation where people are talking about food. You just have to find it and stay there with them. Yeah. Food, politics, those are the yeah. two big. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the gossip aunties. Those are, those yeah, are and the gossip aunties. aunties. Stay yeah, gossip close aunties. to them yeah. too. <laughs> but, but when I was writing Hannah Khan, I actually, I, I did, I think I inadvertently, because food is such a big part of my own life, wrote about food in Aisha at last in my first book. And then everyone kept commenting, oh, your food, maybe your book made me so hungry. I had to go order Indian food when I was eating it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I kind of <laughs> filed it away. So then when I was drafting Hannah Khan, I was like, okay, everyone seems to like my food descriptions. I want to lean into this if this really works. This is, this, and, that's exactly my experience yeah. with Chai yeah. Factor. Everyone was like, the food is so good. I'm like, I didn't write a foodie book. Yeah. I'm like, you just wait, I'm going to write a foodie book and then you'll see how far yeah. I can go. That's it exactly. That's what I did, and now everyone's asking me what biryani poutine is, and I'm like, that was that's not a real dish. That's a made up dish. Uh, <laughs> but it shouldn't uh, be. <laughs> it, it shouldn't be real. I <laughs> should. I strongly I, disagree. <laughs> uh, I I almost want an appendix on both of the books with actually like your top five recipes from yeah. the book. I I I because I can I, I I really did. I'm like there needs to be an appendix here. So if they go into future publications, can I request that there's some recipe appendix added? Because so there's I, there are two. There's two recipes at the end of engaged. Okay. Um, uh, and then my my mm -hmm. editors wants to put recipes on the end of all my books now so she's making <laughs> think about the one that I'm editing right now but then I actually my publicist encouraged me to keep giving her more recipes so for different things like for my newsletter and for different events I wrote out the recipe because they're all for my they're all real recipes that I've made so I've ended up um, I ended up just putting them all on my website like last week or something so if you go onto my website, there's a recipe okay. section and there's a bunch of recipes that are in the book. Oh, so cool. I'm definitely going <laughs> to, I'm going to check this out. This is awesome. Thanks, Farah. I okay. do like to cook uh, and, and I think it's something that I, I think I'm more of a baker, but I, I do like to cook, but I, I don't know if I'm a foodie. I just like to eat. <laughs> so sex is another difference in, that the books have. And I, uh, and I think a lot of it is probably again these these two women are ten year, well, not ten years apart in age but six what is it? you said twenty four and thirty one mm -hmm. I can do math so that's seven years um, and so that's probably you know that that alone is a huge part but um, how did you make the right decision for your character in terms of sexuality and was faith a guiding part a factor or is it again um, a character of where they are in their lives, all of these types of things. Um, for me, it was very much that was the character and that was her, her um, it, it's a complicated question because obviously in the Muslim faith for a devout Muslim, they wouldn't be having premarital sex. Um, but I was writing a character who isn't necessarily very devout, but comes from a devout family. Um, she was very much like a lot of my uh, people I grew up with um, my friends, where they're not so much rejecting their culture, but finding their own place within it, um, and perhaps not as as traditional as their parents, and maybe that uh, changes as they get older, or maybe they get more conservative as they get older. Um, so I think for me, it was just it was it it felt right to write that kind of muslim character for various reasons because i wanted to show that not every family is exactly the same um and i think not every uh 
character I will write will approach um, premarital sex the same way or intimacy the same way. But I think for that character, that was what felt right for me. Yeah, I felt the same way. And and I think for me, the, the other thing is uh, my character is... Uh, on the page, a very devout Muslim, right? So she's she's an observant Muslim, and it's not so much that she talks about faith uh, in, in in the book at all, but just through her actions, like she gets up for pre dawn prayers, which are, is really hard to do. <laughs> she wears a hijab, uh, and and her, and her and Aiden, even though, though they had so much chemistry and they were a little bit physical with each other, like they would hold hands and they they touched each other a couple of times throughout the book. Um, it was sort of an understanding that there wasn't going to be anything more than that, and even that. Some people might be like, oh, they actually touched each other. Uh, really, what I was doing was I was just making space, I think, in, in both my books, in, in the, within the romance genre. I know there's a title for this. It's called A Sweet Romance, right? Where nothing more than, like, at the most kissing will happen. Um, but what I wanted to do is, like, most of a lot of sweet romance is... Um, I don't know. I know there was like a whole trend uh, for about like the Amish love stories. You guys know I what I'm saying? I don't know what they're called. The bonnet oh, romances. Bonnet romance, yeah. <laughs> which uh, I have to be honest, I've never read one. Maybe I should. Uh, but I, I was, like I said, I was, I wanted to make space for this type of story where there is uh, a deep connection. There is romance, there's sensuality, um, but they don't have sex. And that's okay because I, I kind of write about everything that leads up to the, I love you or the, the, the moment of, you know, I'm, I'm really into you. I really like you. And I think that we can make a, a future of this because uh, growing up as a, uh, as a practicing Muslim reader, I never saw this. So I kind of had to make the leap of like, okay, I, you know, I, I enjoy books that describe sex. I, I think is, Islam in general has a very healthy attitude towards sex, but this aspect of it, I've never really saw it represented. And I, I wanted to show that this is possible too. You can fall deeply for someone without necessarily having sex with them before, you know, you, you make more of a formal co uh, commitment to each other. That's really what it is. I'm not really... Uh, opposed to writing uh, or seeing sex on the page. I think it's a lot of fun to read and a lot of fun. Maybe it'll be fun to write. I don't really know. Uh, but yeah, that, that was my thinking behind it. I and love I just, that, actually. I love the idea of, of, of uh, exploring the chemistry between people without necessarily putting, like, I don't, I don't actually write sex on the page. My characters have sex, but I'm not in there in the room with right. them. They're on their own. Yeah. Um, and well, I think that's something that's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's closed door. I say that the door is kind of opening a little bit, but it's still pretty much closed door. And that that's a choice I made for various reasons. But I love the idea of building up that romantic chemistry, because like Uzma said, that's not something that we really learned a lot about growing up. Um, I, I can't imagine what my parents would have said at, at, when I was young if they caught me holding hands with someone in public. Like that kind of um, intimacy where it's not necessarily what like, I want to, I'm going to call it chaste intimacy, but even that wasn't something that people really understood that much when we were growing up. Um, within my community, it wasn't something that was very accepted because the people didn't, um, I'd like to say that it's, uh, for a lot of people, there's this preconception that there's, there, um, there's no line between the chaste intimacy, the leading up to sexual contact, and then so that means sexual contact has to happen. Um, and maybe my, our family, my family was like trying to prevent um, me from doing anything that they didn't approve of, but anything that was even leading up to <laughs> actual touching or anything like that was completely frowned upon. I just did it behind their backs, but, um, and, and that, that I wish it was more open. I wish people would more, be more accepting of um, physical contact, whether it's just a touch on the arm or anything like that when we were young, because then I think we would have been, I, I mean, personally, I think I would have um, been more accepting of my body and my sexuality when I was that now a married woman. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. That, that's interesting. I, I, I feel like uh, uh, the, the the sensuality, and the, the romance of, of like everything that kind of leads up to physical contact is something that is not necessarily explored too much within the romance genre because a lot of emphasis is on the the intimacy of touch, what whatever that touch is, and that was something that I I feel like um, I know a lot of uh, Muslims who, you know, they they never slept with their fiancés until they got married. As far as I know, maybe they did. I actually have no idea, uh, but. <laughs> 
Um, and they, and a lot of them told me that they never even like made out. They never even really kissed. They, and, and to some extent, they didn't even hold hands. Uh, and that's, that's a very common experience. And yet it's never seen on the page unless it's kind of like frowned upon. Um, yeah. and I, I felt, and I, I understand what you're saying for, I, I feel like the South Asian, this is, I think this is South Asian culture, um, or, or East African cu- culture, this, this whole idea of, uh, we are not comfortable with PDA. Like if my parents were actually probably more on the affectionate side for their generation, uh, and being South Asian immigrants than not, like I actually saw them hug. I even saw them kiss a couple of times, but that was considered really weird. Like no, none of my, none of my, uh, friends, parents, whatever, even like hold hands in public. Whereas even though my, my husband and, and myself had more of a traditional marriage, we're very affectionate, you know? And I think that's because we're Canadian. We're, we walk around holding hands all the time, even now. Um, uh, but I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, 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 I think that's a really interesting topic that uh, I think ultimately it just comes, comes down to just having like a wide variety of Muslim representation, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's where I was going with that question is that in both cases, it totally works. It totally works with the character. It works with the relationships. The choices that you make as authors very much work, but it doesn't look the same. And that's, that's perfect. That's, I think that's, that's the strength of it, that it, it's, they don't look the same because why should it? Right? Could why you give it? a shout out to another Muslim author, preferably Canadian, but not necessarily that you really think, uh, you know, somebody should read. And uh, then also, if you wanted to share something for your next project, I know Far and I kind of got ahead on that, but it wasn't recorded. So, <laughs> uh, so I guess shout out to another uh, Canadian Muslim author that you would like to see uh, more, more recognized. Um, this is a tough question because like I said, I said earlier that I tend to read a lot of adult romance and um, adult romance Muslim authors is me and Uzma and then I kind of draw a blank, especially for <laughs> Canadian. There's and not just, a lot. I wish there was more. Um, there's a ton of, of great YA, um, YA Muslim authors that are coming out, even with romances. Um, in Canada, there's SKLE. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, actually, a friend of mine, um, she's only written one book, and hopefully she's going to write more. I keep on her on that. She wrote a Muslim cozy mystery called um, God Smites and Other Muslim Girl Problems, Ishara Dean. Oh, yeah. So she's, she's a friend of mine, and she's working on an adult romance right now, but I know that she's kind of, I don't know if it's going to be coming out anytime soon. Um, so that's another Canadian that I can recommend. Um, and then there's, a, like I said, there's a ton of American ones. There's one that I'm really excited about that I can't remember her. I can't remember the name of the book, but the author is Farinaz Rishi. And she's got a, a YA rom-com coming out about uh, taking place at a wedding. Um, and it's kind of like that. a second Great chance cover. love. Yeah, fantastic cover. So I'm really, really super excited about that one. Um, and then as for me, what I'm working on, um, my YA debut is coming out in November. It's called Tahira in Bloom. Um, and it is about a teen fashion designer and uh, she ends up going to a tiny town for the summer where she learns about floral design and she enters a flower flower sculpture competition with the cute plant boy next door. So it's about flowers and plants and fashion. My, my good friend Asma Zahanat Khan, she writes um, procedural mysteries. The first one was called The Unquiet Dead. I actually have a whole bunch of her books you can kind of see above me right over here uh one of her and she writes uh fantasy novels this is the uk beautiful uk cover of the blood print it's really Mm. gorgeous um so she writes fantasy and she writes um procedural novels and her procedural books are set in toronto she she is canadian but she's currently living in in the u.s so i'm cheating a little bit she lives in denver but she's a wonderful person and a very talented writer and everyone should check her out uh, and you're right for, I think in terms of romance, it's just Muslim romance. It's just me and you, hopefully that will change. <laughs> hopefully uh, that'll change. Yeah. Yeah. But if I could give a shout out to a UK writer, um, uh, Aisha Malik is really fantastic. Uh, Sophia Khan is not obliged is a really great book. I have that somewhere too. Oh, it's right here. I have it somewhere too. Excellent book. And then this is a really Ooh, great book, fun. uh, UK and, uh, and then, of course, there's Zarka Nawaz, who wrote oh, yes. The Mosque. And her first adult s- satire novel, which is hilarious, I've read it, is coming out, uh, I think, in 2022 or 2023. I'm not 100% sure. So that you can look out for that, Z- that Zarka Nawaz, uh, Canadian Muslim writer. 
Um, and as for me, I'm working on my third book. I'm steadily plugging away at it. Uh, it'll be out 2023, so it's going to be a while. Uh, and right now it's, you know, it's, it's coming along. It, it's, it's shaping up to be some kind of a second chance romance that takes place inside of a Muslim convention. Uh, so I don't know what else to say about that because I'm still figuring it out as I, as I go. <laughs> <laughs>